This is a test. This station is conducting a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is only a test. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Good News. I'm your host, Jason Finger. I'm here with Kara Hayes and the Reverend Doctor. A couple weeks ago, uh, we finally made our comeback. We had our triumph comeback here. Um, for us, it was just Don't a matter of Don't call it a minute. comeback. We've been here for years. For years, brother. For <laughs> years. And uh, for us, it was just a few minutes ago for you guys out there. Like I said, this is probably about two weeks later, give or take. And uh, we went into a lot of stuff. We went into Jeffrey Epstein. We went into um, a little bit of the Pizzagate stuff that was going on. Uh, man, it was a lot to cover. And uh, we're going to keep that rolling. And uh, Kara, once again, we're glad to have you back here in the pug cave into the studio with the good news. Reverend Doctor, as always, it's good to see you here. Um, what do we want to go into next? I know we got some stuff to cover. A um, lot going on. God, let's see. What about Greta? <laughs> Kara, what, what's your take on Greta? I really tried to not pay any attention to that because it just, I couldn't. Well, you know, I I think I've said it on this show before. When it comes to uh, climate change, environmentalism, things of that nature, I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I don't claim to be. I I don't. I, I've watched documentaries and I've watched videos and read things on both sides of the spectrum, both sides of the fence. I'll tell you this much: it goes over my head. It all does. <clears throat> in, in, yeah. Independent of Greta. When it comes to climate change, this is a subject I've researched on my own for over 10 years. Right. Just out of my own curiosity, I've watched a lot, I've read a lot, I do not believe in the official story of climate change. Okay. I will throw that out there. Okay. I don't say I'm a denier because I think calling anybody a denier for anything is loaded language. Absolutely. Because the word denier implies that that person knows something to be true but chooses to deny it. So, right. It right. does not account for somebody who questions parts of any uh, any theory or story. Correct. Uh, one thing that I will say that I've seen, uh, it does seem to be big money in, in environmentalism. It does. Oh. And a lot of it, I think that we all know for a fact that oil companies have a way of funding studies. Yes, sir. And, and fudging facts and figures. But what we don't talk about is I think green energy companies do the same thing. That That's one thing. Once again, kind of going back to uh, social media, you know, I, I, I see things on social media that make me scratch my head. One of the biggest things, especially on your uh, page, Reverend, is I'll see a lot of people say, like, when you'll, you, when you'll have something that kind of goes against the popular narrative, be like, well, yeah, oil companies, you know, are saying this. Well, you know, pharmaceutical companies may say this and that. And you're always like, yeah, but what about the other side? Well, I don't want to hear that. Yeah, do you not think they're every bit as capable? Absolutely. In fact, not only are they capable, but they have the uh, advantage of being the good guys, the quote-unquote good guys here, where we're saving the planet. We're not the evil corporations. We're not the evil petroleum companies. So they even have that extra advantage going into this argument. Well, they're trying to save the planet. Sure, they've got millions and millions of dollars. Sure, they've got just as much influence as power as these other companies, but well, I have I have you know. so many, you know, qualms against the official narrative of climate change. Like for one, if you talk to somebody about it and you press, you, you keep pressing, keep pressing until the final conclusion of the argument, where you go, okay, what do you do about it? Even if we play with this presumption that it's exactly like I, I get the climate changes, I get that the climate has always changed sure that's sure. just how it goes kansas used to be covered with a glacier yeah if we believe that right. uh, egypt used to be a, a rainforest exactly. like the weather is always changing but i think humans don't have anywhere near as big of an impact on the world as we like to think we do that this is more about solar cycles this is more about the the, the way the planet just changes all the time right i think that when you press somebody to the furthest conclusion of the argument and you say, so what should we do about it? They, it always boils down to something having to do with creating a globalized taxation body, which should make anybody, even the slowest person, a little suspicious. Right. To stop and scratch your head for a moment. Yeah. And the thing I always point out is I say, let's just even play with this idea. And let's say it is exactly how you say it is that humans are causing the world to change um, that we're just, you know, fucking shit up. What do we do about it? 
it just seems like more common sense to me to say if we play by those rules and that this is true that the real solution is going to be eccentric billionaires like elon musk type guys who yes, are sir. doing the thing like they're doing with the island of trash the the pacific garbage right, patch right. Yeah, how yeah. you know the governments of the world debated on <laughs> levying taxes and doing all this for years and years but it was just one you know eccentric billionaire who came along and said i've got you know i invented this let's clean it up and i can fix this and yeah. I, I i think that's if we if this is real then that's where you're going to find the solution. Right. But the left doesn't want to hear that. No, They want to say the solution is global taxation and socialism, which right. I think that ought to make, like I said, even the <laughs> slowest person suspicious. Right. Well, I mean, and you know, you always hear like, well, let's just stop, you know, using gas. Yeah. What? Do you not understand that the world runs on petroleum? I mean, yeah, granted, I would love to see green energy, you know, alternatives just as much as anybody. But I also, you know, like to see unicorns and leprechauns. And I think it's about as equally possible to see, you know, than some of these green energy that uh, alternatives that people talk about. Well, there's so much we could talk about, Greta, that people didn't want to ask the hard questions <sighs> about because it's it seems like that, again, going back to I don't mean to pick on the left as much as I do. <laughs> yeah. But it's just kind of like they, they kind of bring it on themselves yeah, at this easy, point, yeah. which is that they people on both sides, but especially the left right now, loves to use children right, as posters, yeah. whether it's gun control, whether it's anything, so that yep. if you question any part of a narrative, then you hate children. They'll say, "How dare you?" <laughs> yeah, come against a child. Yeah, you hate children. You do, you want to see children die? It is such a cheap tactic to use. In professional wrestling, we use the term "cheap heat." And that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Bro, that is, that is cheap heat all the way. All the way, 100%. And I, I think the thing with Greta, I mean, first and foremost, man, she's, uh, I believe, autistic, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I, I believe so. So right off the bat, if you if you say anything against this uh, girl, then you're, you're, some, you're, you're saying something against autistic people, which right there makes you an asshole, mm -hmm. against children, against a woman. You know, I mean, let's be honest, you know, being a female doesn't hurt that position either. Well, let's pre let's presume that Greta's parents don't have ties to green <laughs> energy companies or to guys like Al Gore, right, which they do. Right, which they do, right. Let, let's pretend that, and let's pretend that like the story is exactly the way it's presented. If you have an autistic child, is it not child abuse to fill their head from the time they're like four or five years old with the world is ending Indeed. imminently? Now, is that not abuse? No, is this not some some of the same people that would champion Greta? And I'm not, man, I have nothing against this girl. And I mean, I think she's sincere. I, I, I don't know if she's being coached by her parents or not, but I think internally... I think she's sincere, and I'm yeah. not going to criticize her, but I think there's some devious things going on behind her. Well, I was going to say a lot of people that would probably say Greta is so brave and such a, um, what's the word I'm looking for, sort of a poster person for this for youth activism itself yes thank you thank you are these would these be some of the same people that would criticize christian parents or religious parents for telling their kids that they're going to burn in hell if they probably, don't probably and that's probably a fair criticism yeah which i, I totally agree with that 100 percent. but i think it's almost one in the same by telling your 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 daughter or your your child that the earth is going to basically be uninhabitable, you know, with, with climate change. I think you're looking at kind of the same point. It's like, well, you know, the the world's going to end because of climate change, or you're going to burn in hell forever for yeah, sinning, you, you know? You, you completely have a right to raise your children with your values. Right. Even if you subscribe to, you know, apocalypticism. Right. Or, of, of any stripe. But when you have a child who's special needs like that, is that not... Is that not really gray, muddy territory to just continuously, like on a daily basis, tell them the world's ending? You're going to die. Ending. Whether it's whether it's the rapture happening or whether it's global, which right. which that's a whole other subject because, you know, I tend to subscribe to the idea that um, there was a thing I'd read before that made a lot of sense where it's was talking about uh, communism and national socialism, but with uh, the example that it gave with Nazism was that before 1945, Nazism was a political party, but afterward it became a religion. Ah, and okay. you can argue the same thing about communism after the fall of the Soviet Union. Right. That it, it it's become this entire dogma where, you know, it's not a living body, where it's not like, okay, let's look at the strong points and the weak points. It's like, no, like, I'm a full-fledged believer in this. Right. And Don't question it. And I think yeah. that conservatism and liberalism in this country are very, very close to that, reaching that point, if we haven't gotten there already. 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 And 
you know, all religions have end time stories, and I tend to believe that with American liberalism, it's climate change. Uh, that sounds very uh, reasonable, Kara. Hmm. You know, we're not going to let you off the hook. What do you think about this? I, I mean, I, I think that's a really interesting, you know, way to look at it. Um, you know, I, I, I can't say that things aren't changing. Um, true. You know, mm. that's but, true. That's yeah. You know, I, I mean, it's, I, I think it, it is. It is the truth, but you know, going back to what you were saying, you know about, <clears throat> you know, the the big oil companies, you know, well they they have you know reports and data and whatever that supports this and and the green, you know, they have the you can find data and studies that support anything. Anything if you dig hard, uh, it, yeah. it, because you know it's it's all in how in in your perception of it. I think yeah, how those numbers are processed and 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 how you, know. you st- I don't want to say stack it, but how how you yeah. how you set it up. Right. You right. know, I I feel that you know I there there are st- I guarantee you there are studies out there that say you know yeah doing cocaine is great for your health. Sure. You know because <laughs> I, I mean yeah, you, you I, can, I really you can, feel like th- uh, sure. th- that exists because. Yeah. I, you can do well, hell, it with anything. Back in the day, it was. I mean, considered. Yes. I mean, the it doctor was would be in like, medicine. "Yeah, well, exactly. to me, I gave it to kids." Yes, to seriously. me, this is this is the sketchiest yes. the sketchiest <laughs> point. The sketchiest point about Greta to me is that the countries that when she when she was on the floor, um, you know, had the entire world spotlight on her and gave her big speech. She didn't point to any of the real impact countries. Like she China. ignored China. Yeah. She mm-hmm. ignored India. If you look at the list of all of the countries that are the biggest polluters that put out the biggest carbon footprint, it's China, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, um, you know, uh, Uzbekistan, the United Arab Emirates, all these African countries, um, you know, uh, everywhere in Southeast Asia. These are the biggest ones right. anywhere on the planet. Like all the former, uh, you know, Soviet satellite bloc. Right. These are the ones that are astronomically above yeah. anywhere in the West. And it's just so strange that when she had the world media spotlight on her, she pointed out France, yeah. Argentina, yeah. like Canada, all these places America. that are barely that are barely even blips yeah. on the radar. And what you know, and we can talk about how it's strange that these are all that she only pointed out the countries that there's startup green energy yeah, businesses right. in or where Al Gore is influential. Yes, sir. But does it not seem a little strange? And this is why the you know the the P word a puppet comes up to me thinking about it is that if you were somebody who this was your lifetime obsession, you know, uh, you know, so to speak, if you had an autism like uh, attention span. And you just focused on this issue for years and years and years, right. your whole life. And you were finally, you know, before the world media, able to give your one speech. You don't point out the big offenders? Yeah. Well, why do you think that is? I mean, why, why do you think? Because, I mean, you're right. You know, you, you don't really hear about, you know, China and, and India and places like that. Why do you think the, the finger is pointed at the West? The West and, and, you know, countries like France and Argentina. You know, I mean, they're not... Argentina, whatever. Um, but why do you think the that's what's blame so suspicious about it? Put where it should be, and it makes you because, like I said, you know, her parents both have ties to to the the green industry right. itself. And if I'm not mistaken, her father is a uh, is a partner or associate of of Al Gore so in some capacity. There you go. And right all there. the countries that she called out were all Western countries that barely, you know, are are a blip on the radar. Like I said, when it comes to pollution and carbon footprint, and it just seems really, really strange. Right. Do you think it's because these green companies can't get a foothold in places like China and I Russia? I tend to think so, yeah. You know, that it's like, oh, well. They're we not influential in there. there in any level, which points to there being money behind this mm-hmm. instead of like sincerity, which is, is kind of, you know, troubling to think about that. Um, you know that that's what's going on with this girl but i would actually think it would be money on the other side because most of these developed western countries that are, do get the finger point on have tend to have more money and more money to be able to be taxed and taken away mm. i wonder if that's too if it's more of uh, some sort of redistribution plan. or vilification of correct right right the, 
the money. The, the more developed nations mm-hmm. that do have the money, like America. I mean, obviously, we have a lot of money in this world. We also have a very small carbon footprint when compared to everyone yeah. else. But yet, the, the fingers do seem to be pointed here because it seems like it's more to take. Yeah, it, it, if this stuff has as, as big of an impact on the environment as the as the climate change crowd likes to claim, when you actually look at a chart or do, do a breakdown, um, like I said, China, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Uzbekistan, like these are places that absolutely rise so far above, you know, uh, all the, the Western countries. It dwarfs them. Right, almost probably combined. Yeah. Some of these smaller countries, like the West, and some of these ones, you know, America, obviously. I mean, I, was I, I think at it's that. something like the 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 countries that we're talking about in the East. They account for ninety percent. Yeah. But but yet they don't really get that sort of I guess vilification like you were just saying. I mean I don't know I mean China is obviously not a poor nation but I think they were probably also less likely to go for a global taxation system as well. I think it's more or less trying to. It sounds to me like it's more uh, wealth redistribution than anything. That's what it feels like to me because well, China's got all uh, enough problems with the coronavirus. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> something else that's new that you know is kind of. I don't up. have a ton to say about the coronavirus. The only thing I can say is that it's awfully convenient that uh, you know th- this disease comes out and all of a sudden there's no Hong Kong protests going on. Yeah, that's well, you know, the protest is something else that was a pretty pretty big deal. Yeah. Uh, you know, one thing that I. You know, obviously, you hate to see these people going through what they're going through. But I do like how you have that pro-America type, freedom, democracy, you know, type. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess, you know, it's being demonstrated to the world. You know, because you saw a lot of American flags during this whole protest thing. You know, and that's kind of makes me feel good to be an American. Even with all of our shortcomings and the flaws that our country has, you know, it's still kind of cool to see that we're that beacon. We still kind of do seem to be that beacon. But kind of going back to the whole Greta thing, yeah, guys, you know, once again, it was kind of like how we talked about a couple of weeks ago on the uh, Jeffrey Epstein stuff. It's so in your face. I mean, this girl is obviously used as some sort of puppet, some sort of figurehead. And once again, if you have anything negative to say, I mean, I was seeing people on social media talking about like, oh, well, yeah, now you're picking on an autistic child. It was yeah. like, well, no, not necessarily. Now, some people were. Some people were, in all fairness. There was a lot of mean-spirited stuff being said toward her. But even people was like, yeah, I don't, you know, I really don't go for this whole uh, it was the same. Thing. It was the same cheap tactic that was used after Sandy Hook, where any if you weren't for the, the gun control agenda that was coming up, it was, why do you hate children? Yeah, that's it. And it's like, man, it goes a lot deeper than that. But you see a certain element of the media portray it as such. Well, that's what they specialize in, is in painting every single issue as this black or white thing. Yeah, and it's not. You know, we talked about that. You know, Karen, I mean, you were even discussing that before we went on air. It's like, there's very little black and white in this world. No, there's there's pretty much none. None. No, it's a lot of gray. A lot of gray. You might have darker gray to lighter gray, Yeah, but very little black and white. And there's probably a million shades of it. Amen to that, brother. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, the whole Greta thing for me personally, I didn't follow it too. I hate to say it, but it just felt too manufactured to me. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, okay, well, once again, using a professional wrestling term, okay, well, this is a work. Yeah. That's really what I thought when I first started seeing it. So I didn't go too deep into it. I'm like, okay, they're using this girl. Once again, I think Greta is, in her heart of hearts, I think she absolutely believes this. I think she has been given that this doom and gloom type scenario. And I think she means it. I think the passion you see is real. I think that she's legitimately scared. And once again, I think she's legitimate. I just think there's some very devious people behind behind her her to to make her in that way. And I also got to say, you know, man, how are you going to travel the world in your jets and everything else talking about climate change and not go to school and live it up and Mm -hmm. everything else, man? I think it's also kind of easy to say, hey, there's some hypocrisy going on with this thing, which you saw a lot of. But when people say, hey, you know, look at this hypocrisy. This girl's not even in school. She's traveling the world how dare you how dare you make fun of or put down this autistic child i just think i mean what can you do there's no win and you can't even have a counter argument i just really think that at the end of the day we don't have anywhere near as much impact on the natural world as we like to think we do no i i I tend to agree once again i don't know i'm not a scientist i've not done a lot of research in it i've listened to both sides of it now care to what you were saying a little bit ago you cannot deny the changes that we do see you know i look at like uh greenland for instance you know it's actually turning green i've seen these things i mean uh i guess the whole 
point or the question isn't necessarily whether or not climate change is real, but it's how much do we influence Well, there, there's, an, there's an old yeah. Hebrew saying that I'm really, really fond of that goes something the effect of humans can do a lot. Sure. And for, you know, for, for contemporary examples, it's like we can – you know, we can uh, give people plastic surgery to change cosmetic appearance or like, you know, alter the physical appearance of gender on like a basic level. Sure. We maybe can even uh, uh, alter the surface temperature of the planet to a degree or something like right. that. But we can't change a single digit of pie. No, no, you can't, brother. No, you can't take one. We don't have no. anywhere near as much like grand scheme power over the universe as we no. like to think. There's not one second in time. There's an old Kansas song. Not one second will your money buy. You know. I mean, and that's how I come. And I know you're a math dude, so yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, math is math, brother. One plus one is going always going to be two. It always is. But there's nothing you can do to change that. Right. There's absolutely nothing. And once again, kind of even going back to the uh, the great Kansas, the great classic rock band, talking about there's nothing you can do. There's not one second of time that all your money can buy. Same thing with the human influence. Man. Yeah. There's just so much we can do. We're not as big as we like to think mm -hmm. or that we're told by certain people. Well, and that, that that's that's basically like scientism when yeah, you come to sure. it. Sure. It, it's, yeah. it's this belief that science can heal and cure everything it, it's kind of like a, you know it's a, its own worship of man's <laughs> idea of progress it's, or, a, it's almost its own religion to it, a degree it, it is at this point right i think well, carol what do you think about that it's i mean i i never thought about it like that but i mean i honestly kind of wonder and Almost everything can be turned into a religion. Sure. I, I think so. Well, I think we see a lot of that, you know, in today's political climate. You alluded to that a little earlier, Reverend. You know, I think today, you know, with communism especially yeah. being sort of a almost religious thing in itself mm -hmm. now. I think, you, you know, once again, picking on the left, let's go ahead and pick on the left a little bit again. Um, there seems to be not a lot of religion on the hardcore left. You know, it's always been like that. You know, the right's always been considered more of the religious side of things, you know, where the left... I think the left's political views is kind of its own religion. I think that's why you have a lot of... The left is extremely is religious, just in a secular sense. Very secular, yeah. Like, yeah. You, know, you know, it may have been you and I who were talking about this, but how there's a saying that the the modern crop of uh, the the politically correct or social justice crowd, they're, the, the 2020... The 2020 um, social justice warrior even though i'm not really fond of that phrase are the updated form of like the 1920s church lady yeah yeah we were that was us definitely talking about that and i totally get that man yeah, yeah. it's, it's like all you, about like speech codes and like how dare you say this say something yes yeah, say this say that uh, i know you had actually alluded to certain curse words like fuck shit stuff like that how it doesn't have that much of an impact anymore but like racial slurs obviously do you yeah know, for sure because that, that'll get you fired or, or well you what know. we what we think of as profanity is outdated because right. it, it reflects like 1950s social morse where you wouldn't talk about blasphemy sex or defecation or things like that in a polite setting it's correct but right. when, i mean when you look at 2020 like let's be honest we're not nervous about that at all no anymore no, i mean no, no. they we, talk about that on prime time eight o'clock <laughs> television or they're in pop songs yeah you can talk I mean, about yeah. it at work with your boss yeah, like absolutely. when you talk about that you know it's um wh whatever you want to say about it you can't say it's taboo anymore correct right. and you know i when we were talking like i, I use this example where pretend that you're you're at work and two co-workers get into fight right they start arguing things escalate and one says to the other you're a piece of shit or you're a fucking asshole that doesn't matter Something, you, what the what's the boss going to say? The boss is going to say, "Hey, you guys take ten and cool the hell off." Right, right. Go outside now. You substitute that with him calling a him slur or something, like a racial slur yeah. or sexual slur, or like yeah. calling him like poor or something like that. Oh yeah, it That's becomes it. you're fired. Get out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, across the board, and that that makes a lot of sense. Now, obviously, man, that's I think that's good in society that we have because you know you can even think the opposite back in the 50s you know yeah. where if you said fuck or shit oh my god you, but now if you did say a racial slur or a homophobic slur in the 50s no big deal it, it was yeah it wasn't it wasn't a thing yeah so it, it's kind of reversed you know in that yeah, I don't, which I, don't I think, think is a good thing yeah i don't think it's you know. a bad thing i think it just shows a real example of like the nature of what our taboos are and how they've kind of flipped like that and uh, once again i think it's always a good thing not to use racial slurs homophobic slurs you know or even talking about uh, somebody's economic status you know mm -hmm. i didn't even think about that one but yeah i mean if you're like well you you 
poor white trash motherfucker. Yeah, yeah any, man. Anything, could, anything related yeah. to discrimination is what makes us uh, uneasy now. Right, and and I think that's a lot to do with the religion of the left. Once again, I'm not saying these are bad things. In fact, I mean, I think that's a good thing. I think that's it's good that society has moved away from accepting those kinds of slurs and those kind of words. And something that ties in with, like, you know, the, the, the church lady comment I had made was that people like to say that the left is sexualizing everything. Like... You know how, how all this stuff about putting, uh, you know, sexuality in schools, or saying yeah, there's, right. there's uh, you know, th- how many genders are we up to? Yeah, I was going to say like, maybe the transgender thing. A couple hundred. I think we're up to about ninety something. Yeah, when, maybe a couple. Yeah. When when you want to get down to it though, beneath the surface, none of it's really like sexual at all. It's very clinical. Yeah, it's, it's not more, like yeah, right. It you know, there's nothing really uh, you know, erotic or, um, sure, I, I, in, yeah. in any way about it, like. It's this very like robotic, clinical term yeah. of breaking down uh, sexuality. Like you know, um, female sexuality in movies or media is something that the left really doesn't like. No, yeah, yeah, you don't really see it anymore. I mean, like, well, like like with this last yeah. Super Bowl halftime show, you know. I mean, I was really disappointed. <laughs> I mean, I'd heard all this hype, and I I was like, that it. I mean, you know, me being a you know single man, I was like, hey, you know, not bad, but. I yeah. really expected more from J Lo on the pole. Let's just put it like that. <laughs> I thought but, it was amazing. I, I mean, I liked it. I mean, I thought it was a cool, you know, choreographed uh, number. But all the controversy I'd been hearing about it, I was like, man, I'm gonna see something, something pretty cool here. Yeah. You know, which you know, it wasn't. I guess what so, I'm no, trying to I say think, my perverted side was a little let down. I, I was really expecting to see more. So <laughs> no, I, I think I think that that it's kind of a weird thing to to verbalize and articulate, but that. The left, I think they really don't care for for sex as You're much right. as we really think they do. It's more like that they're interesting in you know uh, label labeling, labeling and and yes. making everything really clinical and dry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, man, and, and like professional almost. Right, and, and it's like you were kind of talking about the the gender thing. You know, it's not necessarily sexualizing it. It's just about breaking it into well, I call it confusing personally, but just trying to make it more i guess mundane and everyday but but mundane at the same time yeah exactly like i don't think they really you know when people talk about the left is making our culture so much more uh perverse and everything you're not really gonna see like I, i always come back with that with saying when was the last time in movies you saw really gratuitous show of female nudity or sex like i mean game of thrones well, may- well, <laughs> Good, well, yeah. Okay, I'll give yeah, you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's HBO. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. But you know what? When you did see it, it was met with a lot of outcry online. It was. And, and then I it think was. the last yes, season it was. or two, there really yeah. wasn't that much of it. You're right. Yeah. yeah. It was, it, and yeah, and all right, that outcry really. is coming from the left. It like, was. I don't think they like the, you know, the nitty gritty or the actual display of sex. Right. Or, or female nudity at all. Yeah. I, I think yeah. they just like to, you know make it very corporate and, and clinical I, I think clinical is a great word and great term it's kind of like taking sexuality and divorcing the sex from it from it yeah making it more like you said mundane i can see that now yeah. Kara, did you was you want to add anything about the super bowl it sounds like you were about to maybe add oh, something to that well it, it was so i we watched the halftime show we all thought it was great yeah we enjoyed i i loved i, I you know i mean there there were stuff there was stuff that i Man, Shakira care. has aged so well. Man, she's like a fine wine, brother. Uh, yeah. Hello, J Lo. Yeah, J Lo. Um, I mean, oh my 50 God. years old. I mean, <laughs> oh my she, God. I've always loved J Lo, and I still do. Oh, she's. Mm, Shakira, now what does so she do? Good. She doesn't sing, does she? I've never heard a song. Yeah, I yeah. turned down the volume. She every did time that. Uh, she, oh, she did she that. Did. Hips, uh, hips don't lie. Yeah, I turned yeah, down I the volume. Yeah, I remember that. But she also. I, bet, I can't stand her voice, but I love her ass. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. But she also plays. She also plays. I think she plays the drums and the guitar. Yeah, no, she's a musician. So I mean, so, I mean yeah. she, you know, she's not just a a pretty face to right. say. Right, no, that. she's or, actual or musician. A she nice actually, as my as my grandfather as my grandfather would have said, she will make a preacher put his Bible down. Amen, brother. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, but it, it, it was really interesting, you know. So in in the days following the Super Bowl, you know, I, I kept seeing things on Facebook about you know this this controversy over the Super Bowl halftime show, and I I couldn't understand what the controversy. That was, was me. Yeah. Because I I mean, and maybe it's just the people that you know post on Facebook that I follow. 
I wasn't seeing any of it. So I didn't mm. quite understand what the deal was. And I, I eventually, a few days later, figured out that it was, you know, people who were like, oh, you know, you, you it, it was skimpy outfits, which I didn't really think it was. I didn't but, think they okay. were that, yeah. I mean, I all their important was stuff was covered. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and I mean, they they were bodysuits. You could tell that. So, I mean, it wasn't like you were seeing skin. No. But, you know, so, but I, I was very confused, you know, because I didn't understand. I mean, we know this is a performance. Right. So, why are we going to get up in arms that somehow this is not something that young girls should see when... Because You're that's our pastime at this point is getting up in arms. Oh, yeah. that's true. I mean, that's true. But at the same time... I mean, I don't know. There was nothing to there, it. There wasn't. I watched it. Once again, I watched it with a perverted mindset of going in like, hey, I'm going to see some J-Lo yeah. ass, which is always awesome. And I mean, you know, I, I wasn't worried about the family aspect. Hell, I wanted to see. And I was a little let down. I'm like, was this it? Let me ask you guys. I saw some people on Twitter talking about this. And I try to stay off Twitter. Twitter is absolutely toxic. But I was seeing some people talking about it. And they think it has a lot to do with because it was Latin inspired, and it's mostly not to get too racial here, but it was a lot of white people that had an issue with it. And obviously, that's yeah. the only people I saw have an issue with that's it. That's so white silly. People. Like I don't understand it. Yeah. I, what do you do? You think there's something to that? Do you think it because it was a very Latin based uh, performance, a lot of uh, Latin influences, uh, and it was more? Do you think there may have been some racial issues going on with it? Now, what was the basis of like what they were trying to argue about that? Well, that it was more of a of a place of white privilege that uh, to say anything negative about it. In other words, it's only white people that were getting upset. And obviously, not all white now, because see, I wasn't upset. Now, I don't know it. if this yeah. is the same thing, but one of the <laughs> things I had seen was how you know uh, she broke out the the American flag and flipped it, and it was Puerto Rico, right, right, on that, and I'd heard or read some people trying to say that this was politically charged in an answer to Trump's immigration policy or something, which just kind of seems ridiculous. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't understand that. That's a hard reach on that. Yeah. yeah. I just wonder if maybe there is something to that because I hate to say it, but I kind of thought the same thing. I'm like, man, why are all these white, especially like Christian church goers? Once again, and mm -hmm. that's cool if that's your thing, you know, I've definitely not got anything against that, but they seem to be one of the main people out crying over this, but I've, I, I just didn't think it was that. You can't I, do I, anything now without making some group upset. That's true, too, Reverend. You're absolutely right. But, you know, I did see a meme about it, and I guess we'll probably go ahead and, and cut the Super Bowl off and go into some other uh, stuff here. But one meme that I did see that, that really kind of hit home to me was like, how dare they sexualize this and that and it had a picture of J-Lo and Shakira. And then right under it said, well, let's get ready for the recital. And it showed a young girl all dressed up going to one of these dance recitals. I saw recitals. that one, too. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. I thought that was kind of, once again, man, I hate to say it, but a lot of times in memes, they can be kind of profound. <laughs> and and I, that was one. And I was like, hey, there you go. I mean, if you want to talk about sexualizing children, well, <laughs> there it is. That was the thing I remember talking about. Where what was the name of uh, of the little boy? Uh, was it Desmond or something like that? The one that was the child uh, drag queen. Yes, yeah. That, Do you remember yes, that one? Yes, no, yeah, not at all. Oh, that was it's 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 pretty bad. I lived under a rock. It's, it's pretty bad. And the thing that was such a that was such a, a jump the shark moment that the left had done was they said you know if you you know they would it was BuzzFeed and yeah. all, all these you know really far left re, you yeah. know toxic websites yeah. that were saying if you uh criticize this boy because he's such an inspiration then you're homophobic this and i eight yeah and, like a thing, eight. and a thing yeah. i remember thinking yeah. i said it doesn't have anything to do with sexuality because i don't even think that kid understands what sex is no. i said it's creepy for the same reason child beauty pageants are uh, exactly it's child yes. exploitation Tation. And, and in a sexualized manner, because this this kid, uh, and I don't like either one. You know, I, I yeah. think they're both. It's fucking revolting. I agree, man. And you know, I know Lord, I have friends of mine who have their kids and that stuff. Whatever you do, you whatever. But my God, man, the but the whole thing with the uh, Devin, Desmond, Devin. Yeah, or, or, I think it's Desmond is the name. Yeah, they actually showed. I saw a video of this kid, and he's up here doing this this routine, and grown men were throwing, are throwing money. money, making it rain. You know the making it rain thing oh. to this child, oh. and and, and I found were... out who's behind him too. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a single. Her, his uh, his mother is a single mother who raised him, and apparently there's uh, there's videos that show like she would have like a special K and like all this stuff in the house. Like drugs were pretty oh god rampant, but right. his mother uh, had been <laughs> one of the original club kids. 
Really? From she, back in that day? Yeah, she, okay. she is like, she's apparently like best friends with uh, Michael Alec, the one who Macaulay Culkin played, played in, in the movie. Potty, mo- potty Monster. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, apparently yeah, yeah. like this kid is like a giant art project of that guy. Jesus, and man. And there's some heavy, you know, I would not be at all surprised this kid was getting like abused if he was just like, That's I was sad, like, man. this kid is going to be a straight up head case and yeah how can you not be you know by the time he's like before he hits adolescence this is going to be tragic and you did and you literally had people defending this and saying no that this kid i think they were even saying he was trans he's eight years old come on man yeah i guarantee you that kid doesn't even know what that means not really not not legitimately knows i mean probably knows the definition but he doesn't get it well i think kid, you're, you're eight yeah I, I think that the idea of giving kids all this um you, you know free reign to to decide on complex issues it's 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 ludicrous because kids yeah. don't think in that way no. they emulate their environment like you i know, thought i was a dinosaur when i was eight I Come mean, on, man. I knew a kid. I, in, I knew a kid in my you neighborhood. Are now one. I, hey, he, that was uncalled for. I knew a kid in my neighborhood <laughs> growing up who thought he was a cow, a cat. Yeah, seriously, man. Seriously. I mean, think about all. I mean, for God's sake, like I have a cousin who I was talking with this, and you know, she's she's a girl who's older than me, but she said I was a tomboy when I was a child, and she said it's tr- scary to think how if I were coming up now, and if I had parents like that who would try to put me under gender reassignment. Yes. Just because you you like playing with trucks and GI Joe other than dolls, or vice versa, man. Mm-hmm. There's there's male kids who like to rather play with dolls. That's fine. And another friend I That's have fine. who's who's a child psychologist who's worked for different schools, he told me a story that this has happened, you know, a number of times over the years, mainly over the last ten years. But where parents would come in of like a you know a five six seven year old child, and they would say, you know, my son's pretty feminine, acting. Uh, do you think he's gay? Do you think it's too early to start talking about this? And he would say, I guarantee you that has nothing to do with no. any of this. I said, tell me about your home life. Are you a single mother? Um, d- is the father even in the picture? Right, right. Is, uh, you know, does he have all sisters? Is he small sure. for his age? Like all this stuff. And they say he's emulating his environment. Right, which is which is female. Yeah, yeah. and I, I yeah. said, he, he goes, being gay or being trans is not even something that his brain even comprehends. Comprehends, man. No, no, it's it's ridiculous, man. I consider that child abuse myself. It is. I mean, yeah, yeah. Well, guys, I tell you what, let's let's go ahead and switch gears because I know um, one of the subjects that we want to talk about something I feel very strongly about, and I know it's probably going to take up a good amount of the show. And well, uh, Reverend, before we get to was there because you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, the, the big one. Is there anything else we want to talk about before we get into that? We got a couple short ones we can okay. talk about. Um, you know, the the college entrance scandal oh, that yeah. Aunt Becky Aunt was Becky. a part of. Ugh. Aunt Becky, how dare you, Aunt Becky? I was so <laughs> mortified. I couldn't believe I, it. I just who? <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I it gets even... me. It gets me so angry and and tongue tied. You don't have to do that. No, you shouldn't do if that. If you don't no. get into the school, that is your own dumb fault. Yeah. Well, and poor, and to to me, what it seems. What would Uncle Jesse think? What would the Rippers think? Amen. Hey that's what I'm is a better question. The the point that it that it sort of revolves around is this cultural idea we've settled into that I know Jason, you and I have talked about a number of times uh, over social media, but we we have this idea in our culture that's that's evolved over the last several generations where you go to college because it's an experience yeah it's just another stage yeah. of development yeah exactly it's like going to summer camp yeah or something it's yeah. W- whether you really need to or not is, right. is kind of out of the question or what you're going to study anything it's kind of like you know oh well i'm entitled because i'm rich yeah that i'm going to give my children this experience to go off for four years and cut loose and right do do whatever Have because fun, a party when and, they've and probably say, already been doing that and they exactly, say why, why exactly. are you going to college because that's what people do that's just what they do now yeah mm-hmm. and i think it cheapens the experience i think it cheapens the degrees like how did we I mean, arrive at that point do you think it's something that guidance counselors and schools oh, like brought us up for absolutely i think so not only that but i think it's just it's kind of that it goes back to certain entitlements i think a lot of people for sure you know just have this in time and watch it go i mean that's why you don't see 
wow, okay, I'm really going to catch a lot of shit for this. But I think that's why you see a lot of the engineering type degrees because I, you know, I'm a big firm believer in engineering and math and stuff like that. I think that's why you're seeing less of those degrees coming out and more philosophy degrees. That's fine, man. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with that. But do not sit here and tell me that taxpayers, working people, should pay for your philosophy degree when you know that you're not going to be able to do anything with that degree. And when I bring up to certain people, and I've gotten into arguments with people about this, because they always want to bring up uh, bringing up people, especially from the lower uh, economic classes. You know, and that can even go into, in, into racial territory. You know, I'm like, what we need to do is make sure that we open up the job market for people. In other words, if you have a philosophy degree, if that job does not specifically require a philosophy degree, then that job should be open up to a high school graduate. Well, it shows and how that far really away. pisses people off, man. It's like, well, about my philosophy degree? It shows that I have the, you know, that I that I finished this thing. I'm like, you should have. If you're working at a trucking company as a dispatcher then you should have those skills in high school. That's what high school was for, was to open up the job market for people. If you have a philosophy degree, then you need to be a philosophizer. And guess what? If you can't find a job doing that, you're on the hook. You know, well, the way you do that is you write a book and sell it. There's not a lot they can teach for it. That's what I'm saying. And you don't have to go to school for that. I mean, I know a lot of people that have art degrees. It's like, man, if you're a true artist, a real artist, you're going to be an artist. Well, to you me, don't have to have a piece of paper or a four-year party degree. To, you know, to me, the, oh, co- the college entrance scandal... That gets me. I'm scandal. like, you care what, when, when you got tongue-tied, I get tongue-tied with this stuff. Yeah, the, col- the yeah. college entrance scandal and the fact that every politician has a platform about college debt or yes. free college yes. or something like that, it shows how far away the political class is from everyday people. Yes, exactly. I think. Mm-hmm. And what, were you and I talking about this? Because it might we might have been. Where I said that... It's so interesting how you'll see all these politicians get up and talk about that and say, we need to be more like these European countries, like socialist countries that have platforms for this. And I think, well, what about, you know, there are policies in these, you know, Nordic socialist countries that America could totally benefit from. Sure, absolutely. Like, like, uh, year long paid maternity and paternity yeah, leave. Absolutely. Or healthcare, free just nas- healthcare in or general, free nationalized you know. daycare. Sure. Or something like absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yes. None of them have a platform for that. Right. Right. They all have it for college. For colleges. And it's usually for in helping out people who have, uh, you know, borrowed astronomical sums of money for useless degrees. For, that's my thing, man. To it, me, that is that is that that shows, you know, if if privilege is, 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 a, is a talking point thing, there that is, is privilege to the core. Personified. I think I said it on one of our uh, podcasts. We got a little political on when, oh boy, I don't know why we did that, but uh, I think I said something about, you know, who you don't hear about college debt or the group of people, people like in the fucking ghettos, man, people in the fucking hoods that are, that are struggling to fucking eat or to go a day without being shot. You never hear them talk about, yeah, I want somebody to pay off my philosophy fucking degree. If you want to help those people out, then open up the job market. Let their high school degrees get these higher paying office type jobs. Yeah. But you see, Why are we not making community college or trade school free? That's trade school is what we need. I, I, that so that's what I, I was going to bring that up because as somebody who works in an industry that relies on on people from trade schools, you know, yeah. I mean, I work in commercial HVAC and right. and I have for a number of years now, and it, it is dying because yes. we have we have this this huge gap between the older workers. You know the guys who went to trade school, exactly, or or learned apprenticeships, exactly. You know, out of high school, exactly, exactly. Or dropped out of high school. Well, and we got sold this bill of goods growing up by guidance counselors, where it seems like I don't know exactly when it started. Yes, 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 where you were not going to amount to anything unless you went to four year college, and it didn't matter what you went for. Yes, you just went, and Mm so a lot of these trades started dying off and seeing less and less numbers, and. You know, that may have been for when we were coming up, but if you ask people now, I don't know if, you know, school counselors are still the same way, but people will tell you, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to college and I'm majoring in philosophy. You go, okay, well, what are you going to do with it? And they'll say, well, you, you can't. to enrich my life. Yeah, they, they, say, what? they say, well, it doesn't really matter because now with a degree, you can just get a job right. coming out of it. And I'm like, no, nah, it's it's really not. It's not. No. And you say, well, what? why are you really going to college? And if you talk to them enough, what it boils down to is because it's a stage of development. Yeah. It's just what you do. That's what my parents want years. me to do. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and here's the thing, man. Once again, you know, you look at some of these uh, degrees, like engineering. I always go back to, I always go to the math degrees, because mm-hmm. when these kids start going out, what are they going to do, man? Are they going to take a philosophy class, which sounds really cool, really fun? A psychology class sounds really cool, really fun. Or do you want to go do math for four years? Yeah. Well, hell, man, they're a business. These colleges are businesses, just like any other business. Of course, they're going to say, yeah, come on and do the philosophy degree here, mm-hmm. and you're not going to get shit when you get out except a ton of debt and then they're going to look to the taxpayers the people that did go get the math degrees to pay higher taxes and i think that is bullshit man and that was one of my strongest you know world outlooks man i mean it's just like no if you want to go get a philosophy degree to enhance your life and to be a a, you know a cooler better person that's fine pay for it you know what i I say i say forget all that stuff because what we we're reaching the point where you know i and i'm not talking about like real concrete degrees like if you know if you want to go to college like for a path like like you said engineering law medicine something like that that's one thing absolutely but when you're talking about these liberal arts degrees like philosophy or something like that we're reaching the point where if you want to learn something you can learn it free online you can learn anything online right now you know you can learn engineering online you know with with those subjects like i learned more by reading things online i was interested in than i did in college with that stuff oh sure absolutely and if you have the real desire to do these things then you don't need that for your experience man it's, no you don't it's four-year party experience is what most of these kids go for and back in the olden days it's like, glorified it, summer camp like it, you it's, it's i always and I, I think there's a difference between math type degrees and what i call summer camp degrees well, i want to learn philosophy well i want to learn psychology i want to learn how people think well i'm gonna tell you how they think they, they're going to think that if you don't get a real degree that you need to pay for that shit and, and i'm I mean, but seriously, man, and that, that's something that I get aggravated with. And I really hate these companies who are like, you, you, it requires just whatever four-year degree. It doesn't give you a specific degree. It just says you require a bachelor's degree and whatever. Mm. My thing is, why not open up those jobs for the people coming out of high school that don't have those same privileges to be able to go get that four-year degree if you really want to help people out, or if you really not, want to have more diversity? Or why not in high school start people in a path, like basically split them up, where you say, do you want to go the college route or do you want to go the tech school route? Right. And if you want to go the tech school route, then maybe say you graduate at age uh, 16 or something like that right. earlier, but you take the you know those two years of high school and you basically make it like community college or something sure. where you learn a trade I, I, so totally. you can come right out. That's, I totally agree with that. Totally. My, my high school was sort of like that. Now, granted, this was back in the 90s. Um, you and know, I'm the dinosaur. We, oh, right. Okay. But, I think a lot of, <laughs> but I think a lot of schools don't want to do that because to some people that leaves a very you know uh dirty or muddy image of their mind of splitting people along economic lines yeah, I, I, and, I, and i can almost see that to be yeah. completely yeah. honest with you what i think high school needs to do is have people job ready for those jobs that i was just talking about mm-hmm. i've never seen an office job not require a bachelor's degree yeah. not when it says just a bat it doesn't say what kind yeah once again if you have a philosophy degree then that job should need a philosophy graduate and if it doesn't require a specific degree, then it should be able to go to anybody who was able to get through high school or a GED. Mm-hmm. And it should prepare you for those jobs. It should prepare you to how to take computer classes, Excel, Word, mm-hmm. PowerPoint, all these kind of job, you know, office job stuff. And if you did that and open it up instead of being snobbish about it, because let's be honest, man, what are they really saying? And this is how I look at it, and I may be completely wrong, but when I say, well, you must require a college degree, what I'm really seeing is like you got to come from some money, or you're not going to be able to work here. That's what I see. Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. A couple more short topics before we <laughs> Let get, get into the real that meat and potatoes. <laughs> of yeah. This. Before I get on the other soapbox. All here. right. Uh, the vaping deaths. Well, eh, whatever. No, I'm speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really care, person. <laughs> nah, nah. Um, no, I do. Obviously, man, you hate to see anybody die. You definitely hate to see mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. But at the same time, vaping. It's new. I mean, man, it's still untested. We don't know. Now, you st- do you vape, Reverend? I know. Hell no. I thought you did it one time. No. Uh, okay, okay. I must have got something. No. <laughs> okay, well, good. And I know you don't don't mm-hmm. care. Uh, um, yeah, it's just such an untested. It's such a try-hard thing. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's you know, Some people I've seen vape. I'm like, hey, whatever. No, I'm just <laughs> 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 hit it again, brother. Hit it again. No, um, I do hate to see it though. I do hate to see anybody. I mean, if you use if you're you know. using it to be able to like, you know, smoke hash or uh, THC in yeah, public, sure. hey, why and not? not be detected, that's one thing. Yeah, but, absolutely. I can dig that. I mean, dude, dude, when you're when you're a grown man filling a room with like a cloud of 
blueberry uh crunch cereal or some shit like <laughs> yeah. you're just kind of a douchebag yeah man. i mean you kind of yeah I, once again i don't like to see anybody dying i don't like to see anybody getting sick obviously but I, I i'm a big firm believer man i am a libertarian when it comes to that as hey you know you do what you want to to your body but uh -huh. there may be consequences same thing with smoking cigarettes drinking too much taking drugs hey man if you want to go snort a line of cocaine as long as this table go for it man but if you have a heart attack it's on you, you well know? And, you know and th that's a good point because so much of you know when vaping first came up it was all about trying to design a safe alternative right to cigarettes. right and I think, you know, that's one of the things that we delude ourselves with about science in, in every category is that there's no getting away from consequences. Right. Like, you know, when it comes to the, uh, you know, discussion of, of, of medicine, of the way we like to think of it now, e even if we don't verbalize this because we none of us do, but we kind of like to think that we're going to make death something that's totally distant. Right. That, uh, that, that it's avoidable. Right. And it's, it's not, not, but the truth is everything has consequences. Yeah, and, and I think as long as you have proper education going on this stuff, now I will say that much. Uh -huh. I mean, now, if, if they make, you know, vaping, hey, this is a safe alternative to smoking and people started dying, okay, that's on somebody else. Right. That's on the people's fault, the marketers for, put, for lying. But they're like, hey, look, yeah, this is going to kill you too, but hey, it's a different way to die or a different option of dying. Okay. That's on you. I mean, you know, that's we all make our choices, but I definitely don't believe in a nanny state. I never believed. In. I think all drugs should be legal. Well, in a lot you of know. this, what's causing the vaping deaths is knockoff THC cartridges from China. Right, right. Like, do you know much about this? Because, see, I've got uh, friends who work in the vape industry, and I had them explain it to me before how that really, like, if, if you go back and look at all of these vaping deaths case by case, that these are all people who ordered uh, THC and they usually all came from China, right? And something that they use to to cut, or maybe not, maybe to cut's not the right word, but the, they use as an additive, additive is right. vitamin E. Yeah, correct. And basically, what these people are doing is they're overdosing on vitamin E, right? Because vitamin E doesn't absorb in the lungs; it, it stays a liquid. Am I yeah. right about that? Yeah, yeah. It, it causes it causes pneumonia that basically yes. like alters the entire chemistry of the lung. Right. Once again, I, I go to the whole thing of hey, you know what you're putting in your body. I mean, and as far as the THC cartridges go, I actually, uh, I've had a little bit of experience with those mm -hmm. over, over, the, over the years. And I'll be the first one to tell you, there's a definite difference in the cheaper ones and the more expensive ones. I, I can tell you that from personal experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've done it. I mean, I'll go ahead and admit that. I don't do it anymore. But I did try them. And yes, man, I, I had some bad coughing issues when I had the cheaper ones. I spent the money, got the better ones, a little bit easier. Uh, but I also have friends of mine who had to completely stop using them because the doctors straight up told them, hey, you're developing lung issues here. That happened, yeah, uh, to a personal friend of mine. I won't go too much into detail, but this person had to stop using cartridges. And, yeah, they were the ch cheap ones, the knockoffs. So yeah. let's go from vape to fire. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's Perfect. What do we think about the Amazon uh, and Australia wildfires? It's terrible, man. You know, obviously it's... But it, it is, but at the same time, isn't it so interesting how it just completely disappeared oh, from yeah. the American news media cycle once it, you know, they couldn't connect it to climate change? Yeah, we, we were talking about that a little earlier. Yeah, once again, it's the media having their agendas and their narratives that they have to push. Well, something, it seems like it's only worth reporting if there can be a spin put on That's it. That's it. And, and I, once again, you know, we're talking about colleges being businesses, how they're like, yay, please come get your philosophy degree and spend $90,000. Same thing with the the media. You know, it's like, hey, yeah, we're going to put some out here, but the the advertisers have to pay. Well, and, and it becomes so not watching. It becomes so embarrassing when they really point to a lot of the stuff, like with the Amazon wildfires in particular. Okay, it seems like every year or every few years, there's wildfires that happen out west in California. Oh yeah, man, it's natural. Yeah, it was happening it's, when well, I lived there in the eighties. Yeah, it's yeah, not just seriously. natural. It's that the reason we're having catastrophic wildfires is it goes back to environmentalism, which it, it's it's kind of it's a complex thing to explain. But basically, a way I can boil it down in an example would be: say you have you know a, a patch of. Um, you know, a, a patch of forest out west, you have some environmental group that says, hey, this is a natural habitat to some tree frog or some yeah, breed, right. uh, breed of moss. So they'll lobby a politician to say, you need to set, you know, uh, X amount of acres, like several hundred thousand or million acres aside as basically like a no-go zone for, right. uh, for, for humans. Right. Well, so what happens to that is that 
fires or wildfires especially are natural but when you don't have people able to come in and clear underbrush yes right you know clear dead trees and all this because and that of, shit just racks up for 40 50 years because a lot of this environmentalism started in the 1960s correct right when it finally does hit it's catastrophic yes exactly because of these restrictions and guys something i want to go ahead and and, and put out there since we are kind of getting a little uh, long in the day the big subject i think we ought to save that for the next episode the, the big one we were going to jump into. I'm liking that. Because, yeah, we were running a little long, and uh, that one, I don't want to cut any corners with that one. Mm-hmm. I want that one to come in heavy. We'll leave that for the next time, if that's if that's good with you guys. I'm good with that. Because, uh, yeah, I was just leaving it, it, at the time. It deserves the right yeah. treatment. Agreed. Yeah. Did you see Joker? I loved it. You um, did? I did. not seen it yet. Have I you can't. not? No, but I can't wait. Well, we may... I, I liked it, and I'm not somebody who really cares much for superhero movies. But um, this wasn't really a superhero movie. That's what I dug about it. Like, yeah. it, it, man, it, it reminded me so much of Taxi Driver, of yeah. uh, the the King of Comedy. It, I love the whole 1970s vibe about it. Like, I know this this is kind of a movie discussion, but there's something I've always loved about Warner Brothers movies from the 1970s. Yeah, there was such a gritty edge. It's grittiness, to them. Man. like whether it yeah. was uh, The Exorcist or Bonnie and Clyde, even though that was a little early in the 70s, but Deliverance. You know, um, yeah, yes. The, and it wasn't just the. I'm not just talking about the subject matter. I mean, the there was something about the the film the, itself. The feel it was just of it. Dark. Yes. And gritty and. It really captured that. Like Raging Bull Taxi Driver, is, is, that's my number one from yeah. that era. When you talk about that, when I think of that type of movie, I think of Taxi Driver. That one's the one. And I just watched that one for the first time, like maybe five or six years Did ago. Did you really? So I was per, I was an adult when I was able to watch that. So, Kara, I don't want to go too deep into spoiler territory uh, for not only you, but some of the other listeners. Uh, and it actually kind of does go into what we're going to talk about next time we're all together. Um, I thought it was the biggest overhype as far as subject and and material goes because i went in expecting something completely different than what i came out of that movie with what'd you go in expecting i expected it to be um very i I mean for lack of better term man i thought it was going to be kind of a white nationalist type movie because i was hearing a lot of stuff about it you know um racially Mm -hmm. overtones and i I went in even with like oh shit kind of attitude like that really seemed to be the buzz on on the internet beforehand yes and i even saw some absolute straight up lies in fact i saw uh somebody say something it was on twitter once again that was my own fault for even being on twitter that actually made me about not go to the movie but apparently somebody and it was a lie it was not in the movie but somebody said that he uh, utters a racial slur the uh, a very bad racial slur several times over and over and over and I was like, man, I don't know if I really want to go see this. You know, I mean, obviously, I want to see the Joker. I want to, you know, I, I love, I like superhero movies, and I, I love the Joker. I love uh, Batman. But even when I read that, I'm like, oh, sh- well, what, people, am I, what am I going to go see? Well, here? it seemed like people tried to paint it as this is this angry uh, white man. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, like uh, the same type of people who are. Uh, fit all the the check the check blocks of yeah uh, of mass shooters right that he gets he gets jumped by uh, a gang of minorities right right uh, he's got a black woman he obsesses over and sexualizes correct right uh, you, you know they they tried to paint it as the, it, this is basically a guy who gets radicalized into white nationalism right uh, made as a comic movie right and it was such bullshit and it was not that at all in fact like I said what I was just talking about that almost kept me from going to put money in it because i was like i don't know if i want to actually put money now i didn't even know the context Mm -hmm. but it was a lie it didn't that never happened that was not in the movie and i mean i was just like why would you say that and lie about it but i mean they're talking about all the gun violence one that was something else i'm like man Mm -hmm. i'm going to witness a a massacre yeah i think there's like four times the people use guns in this movie and it's very light light usage of guns i mean a little slight spoiler here. Even the Joker's use of a gun is what, like once, twice, twice. I think he uses a gun a couple twice. times. Once on the show. Yeah, yeah, on. yeah. For the big climax of the movie. Yeah. Uh, and that was it. And that was it. I mean, there's literally more gun violence in the first five minutes of John Wick than in this entire movie. Well, a thing combined. that really impressed me, but Seriously. also was kind of disheartening. Like when you think about the the broader context of it, is that what what impressed me is that. Like I said, I'm really not a fan of uh, of superhero movies right. of like you know the the comic universe or anything. Right. But 
this all basically wasn't even it a wasn't. comic movie. No. That if you, you know, that when the movie starts on the opening screen, it's a, it has Gotham City right. written at the bottom, and then there's a couple throwaway references to Thomas Wayne. Yeah, that's it. And I said, outside of that, like maybe five seconds of the movie, this really isn't even no. a comic movie at all. And no. it made me think why why they felt the need to do that. Right. And what what I was talking about, about it feeling disheartening, is it makes you think that if a lot of these movies like taxi driver how we were just talking about or the king of comedy or clockwork orange or anything if they came out now they wouldn't be able to get funding exactly they would get buried on netflix yes and it makes me think that we've arrived at this point in culture where people won't come out in mass numbers to support a really well-made uh, movie, well movie for adult unless we can tie it to like you a, know, a, a children's story a comic book yeah now now I, me and you do tend to disagree slightly on that um because you know i look at the comic book heroes and and, and i do like the movies you know mm. I, I like about just about all of them i look at it as more as literary figures from my childhood children's story same thing mm. <laughs> yeah i mean we're just kind of saying it in, in yeah. a different way um but i too i totally 100 percent agree with what you're saying about joker because Gotham the City could have easily been New York City. It was New York City. It was New York. The Thomas Wayne character could have been any politician. Mm-hmm. It didn't have to be Bruce Wayne's father. Um, Bruce Wayne's in the movie slightly. Like I said, not to get too much spoilers. I think that's out, actually out there. Didn't need to be in the movie at all. It was very kind of even shoehorned in. Yeah, it was. Yeah. This, it, it, was, it felt like such an afterthought. It, it was, absolutely. It felt like that this was already a complete movie and a complete story. But what I mean by the whole last tirade I went on is that it seemed like that this was such a marketing decision that oh, this yeah. could have been this I could have so. been this could have been an, uh, like a grown up movie. Oh, absolutely! Without and the, we don't really yeah. have grown up movies anymore. No. at the multiplex. No, and I totally agree with you. After watching that movie, in fact, I saw you post something on social media. I'm like, he's 100 percent right. This could have been called The Clown. Yeah, and just about a man's descent into mental illness. It is a great movie. It's a slow burn too. Mm-hmm. Once again, if you think you're going into seeing a Batman movie or an action movie, you will be disappointed. Was it the best movie last year you saw? I think so. Yeah, I, I would go that far. It's up there on the list yeah. for me. Um, I'd have to go back. And I'm gonna tell you though, it doesn't have a lot of rewatchability uh, for me. I, I do have it on my PC. I did acquire it online, and I still have yet to watch it. But now most superhero movies I can watch two or three times, but but they're empty, man. It's like empty calories. It's mm-hmm. the, I saw some really you know, good. Yeah, it's not that easy to digest. Yes, the yes. Joker. However, I mean, if I'm going to sit down and watch that movie, it's about two two and a half hours. I got to really go into this movie. I saw a know. handful of really good movies last year. Uh, last night, I actually took my uh, son and nephew to see Uncut Gems. The uh, new I saw Adam you Sandler post, movie. Yeah, that was that was a good one. I enjoyed it. Um, the best movie I would say I saw last year was uh, one that flew under uh, a lot of people's radar, but it was called uh, Midsommar. I have been I've heard about. That. I have to watch oh, it. I want to see really. That. Oh, I've heard. God, that is such I, a good movie. I, I have been here. I've heard mixed reviews. I've heard some people. Well, say you're going to hear a lot of mixed reviews was, on it because yeah. it, it is definitely a love it or hate it movie. I, I've heard. That's what I've been hearing. And did I, you see I Hereditary? See because I that did. same director. Yes, and I love that movie. Okay, tell what did you think of Hereditary? I because, thought it was great, man. Yeah, I did too. It, it was another one of those slow burn. Have you seen Hereditary? I have not, but uh, I've. It's also one I've been told I need to see. I highly recommend it. There, there were moments in that movie that are honest to god disturbing like really disturbing it is one of the best horror movies i've seen i think i, I, I think yeah. it, it may be the best horror movie i've seen in the last 20 years I, I, I would almost go with that bro i can't think of one that comes over that one honestly see there were a lot of complaints when it came out that people felt like that the story was so schizophrenic because you were watching two different movies yeah at the same yeah, time. yeah yeah because you know you, you had like this slow burn family relationship yeah. drama and you also had a supernatural occult story and i said that was what i liked about it because you on one hand you almost had you had a very like roman polanski rosemary's baby yeah uh slow feel to type, it. and yeah. on the other like you know uh, an occult uh supernatural right. story and on the other hand you had this uh story that was almost like uh like john cassavetti's or like a, a woman under the influence or the movie the ice storm like one of these uh or american beauty like watch right. a, watch a family collapse yeah yeah and, and all at the same time and like i said there are some moments in that movie that it For me to feel uncomfortable watching a movie says something because, you know, I'm pretty desensitized to a lot of Mm -hmm. stuff, you know, especially in some industries that, you know, me and you both worked in. And there were moments in in Hereditary that I was like, oh, God, man. Well, Midsommar is even more 
uh, more schizophrenic than that. Like, I, and I, I don't want to say that in it come across or get misconstrued as being a negative thing. Right, right. It's it is a very difficult movie to talk about because I don't know how to classify it as a genre. It is not a straightforward horror movie. Right. Like you go into it expecting one thing just based on the trailers. This is like a three hour long story and it's you know there's there's elements like you can i got the same vibe as uh, when i watched hereditary that this director is not just a fan of horror films but he's a real fan of like art films right right kind of getting into the making you think about things yeah like like all tour type pieces and so basically you have like a real wicker man vibe that's right. like obvious like what you could call folk horror yeah sure maybe right. on the surface but it's also you know it's also um kind of a kind of a drug trip movie like a like the movie altered states really or something okay. it's also like it's yeah. also uh like a relationship movie that kind of reminded me of movies like clueless or she's all that really or something it's in a wow. really dark way <laughs> wow, it's okay. also um it, it also more than anything it kind of reminded me of movies sort of like um i, I don't know exactly what to call this uh, uh, genre but movies that are like uh like boogie nights or mash or mccabe and mrs miller where it's kind of like it's a three-hour epic where it's like this outsider coming into a town full of weirdos and you meet this big cast of like 20 or 20 right. like there's 20 main characters or so and they kind of like become family yeah kind of an it's ensemble a like type that. yeah and but but it's about a cult i might have to check this out i've heard a lot of uh polarizing things i've heard some really good things like you were just saying i've also heard some real negative i've, I've actually read reviews where people like just do not even try to watch well this and movie, I, th- I think you know? i think part of the <laughs> the way that the studio screwed up is it was marketed as a slasher movie so, so the people were disappointed and what yep. what i loved about it is that i've never seen a movie that deals with it quite like this where to the director the you know the gore is there right. but in a lot of ways it's treated as an afterthought there's some scenes where people just disappear into the woods in the background behind what's going on in front of the camera right. and you never see them again and, you, and they're just gone and yeah. what the director's really interested in is it's more like okay within five minutes of stumbling upon this place you the audience realize they've walked into a cult yeah yeah and the thing is though that within this they realize they've walked into a cult the question the director is more interested in asking is why does this group of as individuals why do all of them choose to stay Uh, okay and it's kind of it's kind of a story of like like what you're watching is kind of like a like a character study almost of people who join cults that sounds oh. interesting i'll tell you what guys before we uh hit the stop button here speaking of movies kind of polarizing movies i do want to ask you guys if you've seen a movie that i personally loved i love this movie uh darren Ar- aronofsky aronofsky thank yeah. you thank you uh, mother are you guys that's re- been on my radar but i had I, I, okay. I haven't read any reviews for it. i'm aware of it i saw trailers for it but i haven't checked it out i tell you guys what it, it well, we'll I watched that movie, Miss Somer. You watch Mother. We'll we'll reconvene and we'll I'll do and, that. And Carrie, you you need I'll to watch, watch all these. You need to watch and Hereditary. And Hereditary, yes. You need to watch that and one as jo- well. Yeah, I did Joker as well. Yeah, Joker. Highly I a lot recommend. Of movies to watch. So there's yes. something there's something I wanted to do for for the end for for wrapping this okay. up because you know we have had a six month break like we talked about on our last show and this is in a lot of ways kind of the beginning of season two almost yeah, sure. if you want to brand it this way now it's not going to be as regularly scheduled right as as it was because um really like we said personal issues professional issues it kind of makes it difficult when you have people like us all trying to it's kind of just calling each other up and going hey when you when can we all get in yeah. the same room together yeah exactly and you know which is a lot harder than you would think yeah life kind of really complicates it makes <laughs> it difficult <laughs> that damn pesky life man. so the you. thing i wanted to do is we're kind of going to do a little introductory thing okay where um on the podcast there's something that you and uh our good friend mike not present today like to do where when you have guests you ask uh na- name your favorite uh favorite wrestlers yeah yeah so we're going to do a little something like that okay for the for this ending segment all right so now you know that uh I think maybe all of us in the room are. I'm a big hip hop fan. Always sure. have been. So I'm going to ask a variation of the question: Who are your top five of all time? Top five hip hop rappers. Yeah, rappers is in lyricists. 
Oh, wow, man. Uh, so, Kara, do you want to go first? Or you want me to tackle this one? Top five? Top five. I can't even give you a top one. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I'll take her five. Uh, let's see, man. Not vanilla ice, not rich. Oh, dear God, no. No, um, no, no. Wow, man. Um, okay. I don't know if these will actually be in order. My favorite rapper of all time, man, um, who's probably not considered to be one of the greatest of all time. Some people may or may not consider him. I think this man was the absolute greatest hip-hop front man to ever exist. I think everything that came after him, I just think he was an innovator, a pioneer. He was definitely an innovator. Uh, hip-hop wouldn't be where it is today without this man. I love him. I listen to him pretty regularly. I, I probably listen to this artist at least a couple times a week on my playlist. Easy e 100% man without Easy e there and have never been an NWA. Uh, was he the greatest flow? Man, no, nah, not really. Not really. You know, anybody would tell you. I think Easy e would have told you that while he was alive. Um Dr. Dre brought the best out of him. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dre had to work with him a lot. When you listen to him, nobody sounds like Easy E. He definitely had the most unique voice in, in, in hip hop. Uh, like I said, without him, without his money, without his back in NWA, we would have never been. Without NWA, we probably wouldn't have had anything. Yeah. I mean, I really believe that. I think NWA, I mean, we had Run DMC, you had LL Cool J, you had some of the old school guys, you, you know, the Beastie Boys. But. NWA took it, ran with it, made Dr. Dre who he was, mm -hmm. who in turn brought out Snoop Dogg and everything else. None of that would have happened without uh, Easy E. Easy E's voice was was unique. It was true to himself, man, and he was the real deal. That's what I love about Easy E, man. When all the stuff he rapped about, he did that shit, man. Mm -hmm. He was not a studio he gangster, man. He lived it, man. He didn't even want to rap about it. He just wanted to finance it. Yeah. And they're like, no, man. And if you watch some of his concert footage, I mean, he and that was one of the first hip hop groups to really go out on the road, man. Easy E captivated. He was the Domin. He was the Domin. David Lee Roth. You know, he was the Ozzy Osbourne. Easy E was the only real gangster out of the bunch. For real, man. I mean, and that's across the board. Mm -hmm. um, so, man, he's definitely my top five. Another uh, NWA alumni that, man, I always put in there, and I don't think gets enough props that he deserves his Ice Cube. Amen. I mean, dude, Ice Cube was next level, brother. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I always got to put the Notorious B.I.G. up there, man. There was something about B.I.G.'s lyrics. I always say B.I.G. was like a country singer. The thing I say about B.I.G. is that when people have the have the Tupac Biggie discussion, yeah, which is always what I always say is that Tupac was the better storyteller, Biggie was the better rapper and lyricist. You see, I disagree with that to a Dude. certain degree. I do, man. And here's here's how I look at it. Tupac's not in my top five. Man. He's not in mine either. Yeah. He's not even in my top ten. Yeah, I may have him in my top ten, but he's definitely not in my top five, man. The thing about Big, I I kind of put him like a country singer. I could shut my eyes and listen to Big tell a story in rhyme. And I could see it. Mm -hmm. Very few, very few singers, songwriters, rappers. I can only think of maybe Waylon Jennings, Willie Nelson, and Notorious B.I.G. Mm -hmm. who can do that for me. I mean, that's it. You know, Waylon, Willie, and, and Biggie Smalls, man. You know, that's a hell of a combination. But really, dude, mm -hmm. um, uh, when I when he would rap about things, I could literally see it unfold in my mind's eye. That's talent, man. That's storytelling. And uh, there was something about his flow, man. He just hooked you. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, Let's see, man. That's got to be that's that's, in my, that's my top three, man. Dude, I, I really kind of got to put Method Man up there. You know, All right. uh, there was something about Method. I didn't think he was the greatest flow per se. He was the most star ready, ready based yes. star. Of yes, the group. there was something about him. Um, and the Wu Tang Clan. Obviously, everybody loves Wu Tang Clan, man. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. It's for, it's for the children. It is for the children, dude. I'm glad somebody finally got that. Yeah. Um, but there was just something about Method's rapping in his lyrics man that just i don't know man just kind of captivated me uh now in the, the fifth one dude that could be so many there i may have a lot of ties here dude this one's gonna be a little controversial but Go somebody that that always comes up man is mca from the beastie boys dude i just the that's beastie, a very unconventional choice it is isn't it mm -hmm. yeah uh when he died man i felt hip-hop lost a true voice um once again, man, you know, not really known for going deep into stuff. Not really, you know, he's not going to be like a Nas or a Jay-Z or anything mm -hmm. like that. But for me personally, um, man, he's up there. B-Real's another one. Uh, Do you know what the Beastie Boys were the kings of is simile? Yeah. I, I mean, Every they, they, line, like, you know, I got more rhymes than Rod Carew. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Everything is like or as, every line. Yes, across the board, man. Yeah. And they also really brought it mainstream, but... Yeah, man, you know, I got I to gotta throw MCA up there. Once again, B-Real's up there for Cypress Hill, man. That was one of the first rappers I really got into. Mm -hmm. uh, 
damn man, this is a hell of a conversation. I can the keep one, going. Red Man, dude. Red Man's up there he, for me. Man, that's that's solid. But like the ones I would say is like I'm, you know, I've been a fan for ages. Chuck like, D, man, Chuck D. I, I, see, I never think of Chuck D by himself. I always think of him as part of the group. Like I never, yeah. I never think to put him in a top five. But at the same time there's nobody like him he's like no. inimitable and he was the voice of public enemy man i mean even with mca man you had the other two you had the other two beast boys ad rock and um uh god who was the other one ad rock mca uh mike, mike d. d mike d yeah. um they were a unit but man there was something about mca mca was the star of that kind of like easy e i put in front of nwa even mc wren man yeah mc wren was uh, people sleep on mc wren the one i w- okay i would <laughs> My, my top five really isn't in an order, but the one I would put at number one, unquestionably, is Rakim, of mm. Eric B. and Rakim. Okay. There's yeah. never been anyone like him yeah. because his flow was not aggressive no. at all. It was very calm. It Smooth, was confident. Man. And a lot of times, all it was was about how good at rapping he was. He was, which he was. But he made that shit sound gold. Damn right, man. Yeah, great choice, really. Yeah. He's up there. I'm gonna put I'm gonna put Nas up there, even though yeah. really only his his first album is really the only one I like. But man, that first album was fire, dude. That first album reinvented the genre. The genre, yeah, it really did. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, and, and lyrically, I mean, you can go back and like read it line by line. Yeah. It is, it's fire, fire, yeah. fire. Um, I'm gonna say Big L, who was a who was an yeah. underground New York rapper. I love yeah. Big L. Um, I mean, he he did Eminem better than eminem before eminem, eminem. i mean yeah good that's lo- another one people sleep on people sleep on big l but a lot of people don't even know who that is yeah man. i mean yeah. You, i didn't you know have, who he was till just a few years ago to be honest with you You have man. to be a real hip-hop head to know who big yeah. l is because i wasn't even familiar with him back in my day and, uh, and actually a young guy turned me on him he's like man you didn't listen to big l so no he's like go check him out so i went on youtube and i'm like holy shit man yeah when I you listen to songs down. like devil son or all black yeah like, that is, yeah Woo. That's fire. Once again, I know I use that phrase a lot. Fire, that is straight man. fire. Yeah. Um, I'm also going to add uh, Jizza from Wu Tang because I always yeah. thought he was the most cerebral of the bunch. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to say Ice Cube. Yeah, got to put out my top five. Yeah, now man. there's some I could like. I was tempted to throw in, um, like Cool Keith, for example, because I've always thought nobody does interior uh, uh, rhyme better than him. Of right. like, you know, not just rhyming the last word of a of a bar, but like. Uh, the middle like kind of like, mid-sense or yeah, arrange, mid, arranging yeah. patterns for rhymes throughout yeah. it like it, it I, there's nobody better than that at him you know I've got to put Andre 3000 up there too man he's up uh, there too he, he's up there big boy w- was the shit I always see that's another one like Chuck D where I always think Outkast is a group it's a group but man they were both great those double uh, solo albums they basically put out The Love Below and Speaker Box yeah dude because I was always on, everybody was always about Andre he was like the, the front guy you know but man that Speaker Box big boy's album I thought it was far superior yeah. than Love Below. I mean, I mean, I played the fuck out of that CD, man, and still will, still do to this day. So another question I got. So Kara, no top five hip hop? Nope. 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 <laughs> I feel like you're being left out here, Kara. No. Oh, yeah, we're, yeah. <laughs> I want to bring you in here, you know. I, it, Tupac, well, it, come on. Eminem, yeah. come on. I, I mean, I, I, I appreciate Eminem. <laughs> um... I, I do appreciate Ice Cube. David okay. makes me listen to that sometimes. Me, me and Dogs have had a few Ice Cube discussions. Oh actually. yeah, he, he's a fan. Yeah. We we talk about how people sleep on Ice Cube. Mm-hmm. Uh, dude, yeah. I'll tell you yeah. a thing. I'll tell you a thing. There's a very good discussion to be made for Ice Cube being the greatest rapper of all time. Hey, man. I'll tell you why, dude. When you start looking at uh, the ratio of albums that came out, yes, sir. How many rappers can you say had one perfect album? He had, five, he had he had four really five if you include straight out of Compton straight out of Compton because well, that was his Compton. album man yeah he yeah, had he straight out of Compton album. America's Most Wanted Death Certificate lethal Predator injection. and Lethal Injection God, mighty, that lethal is five injection. perfect albums like, back to back to back man there's a great case to be made yeah, I, I I totally can see that man and and like I said people for some weird reason want to sleep on Ice Cube America's Most Wanted yes. come on man. I still remember the first time I heard that because I knew him from NWA. Well, and I, I mean, he it. used the Bomb Squad. To yeah, that one. yeah, which is Public Enemy's production team. Yeah, I mean, he was right there with those guys. That album, brother. Yeah. Shit, man, it still hits to this day. It hits. So here, here's a oh, question God. I wanted to ask. That's sort of like a flip side from uh, from the wrestling discussion. Now, I'm a huge boxing fan. Right. Like boxing. Like I mean, I like a lot of other sports, but boxing is the one I'm a dork about. Like if you ever get me going on social media, you've seen me. If I get going talking about boxing, I will talk and talk. Well, I know we've actually had some boxing talk. Yeah. Yeah, So now, normally for guests, I'd like to ask, you know, who 
who who would be like your top three right now right. or something like that. But I know that you're not a, a huge uh, boxing no. fan, uh, so wouldn't be really you know apt to the the current conversation. But the question I want to ask is like the 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 great barbershop I question: know exactly Tyson or Ali in their proms? Yeah, correct in their proms. Carrie, you go first. Oh, <laughs> I know you geez. can come in on this one. That is the great uh, boxing oh. debate. Yeah. And that's a, that's a good question. But in their primes... If like you to, match them up in their primes... I'll oh. just go ahead and say it, Tyson, just right off the bat. Tyson, done. I, go ahead, Kerr. Yeah, I mean, that's I, that that's my leaning as well. It, it really is. I, I would go Tyson. He, see, he, he was a freight train, man. Well, see, here's he what I would train. say. They it, It's more of a complex question than you see on the surface because they both aged differently. Yeah. Tyson's yeah. peak was early on right and you know post prison tyson was a shell yes of his no, former man, he, self. he was yeah he ali was. arguably got better as he went on as he yeah. aged yeah you know and after he got out of uh you know after uh his stint like over vietnam and everything you had the the uh frazier you had yes. uh foreman i mean even before that you had liston i mean he had some and i you know uh reverend you make a good point right there carol i want to see what you think and i think a lot of that Tyson didn't have the same kind of competition, I think, that Ali had. You just mentioned Liston, Frazier, um, Foreman. Yeah. Come on, man. These are all legends in their own right. Mm -hmm. I don't think Tyson had the same competition. But see, there's a ready-made answer to that because people will often say Tyson ducked fighters, but at the same time, there was nobody who wanted to fight to him. To fight him either. Or you could also say, well, how could you compete with him, man? Because when you got in the ring, you not knocked out in the first round. So maybe if a Foreman and his peak would have got in with a Tyson yeah. he would have just been put down in 30 seconds like everyone else there's an argument to be made for well, my, that my quick answer to the question is Tyson and yeah. the thing I would say is the version of Tyson that beats Spinks I say yeah, uh, could, yeah, could, yeah. Could be there's any, a good example could, for, could beat any yeah. fighter ever, ever in the ever. heavyweight division and the thing that people will talk about is that uh, you know the one Tyson's real one Achilles heel or weak point was that it was easy to get in his head. Yes, man. And that yep, is where yep. Ali could have wrecked him. And now uh, you make a great point with that. And also, just to kind of continue with that, once again, man, I'm nowhere near the historian that you are. You know, I want to put that out there. But I think Ali also was one of that, those first guys who really came out talking a lot of shit. Yeah. So, you know, he's always going to have that kind of as his on his resume as well. But no, you got a good point. If anybody could have ever gotten in Tyson's head, it would have been Ali at his prime. And that's absolutely. The, and, that, and see, that even brings up another question of even though that could have happened with Tyson in his prime would the fight have even gone long enough for mind games to factor that, that's the thing too man I mean I, I think that Ali could have been knocked out in 30 seconds like everybody else man I went back and watched some of his greatest knockouts this has been about six seven eight months ago maybe within the year let's yeah. put it like that but guys I forgot just how completely badass this man was I mean, obviously, I came up during Tyson, so that was my boxer from my generation. Man, like I said, I went on YouTube to watch that shit. I mean, he's just knocking son of bitches out. Mm -hmm. Bam, bam, bam. I mean, it ain't nothing to it, dude. I mean, even punches that don't look that hard. Yeah. You just catch them with some left hooks or something. Man, they're gone, man. They're out. So, yeah, man, I short answer, Tyson. I don't even know. I think the bigger question would be, guys, would it even be a good fight to begin with, like you were just alluding to? That's a that's i mean that's the question dude this is this, this <laughs> you can go to any barber shop oh, anywhere any afternoon and hear this debate to, for, for and hours people get heated heated man yeah yeah especially with the generation man it's the like the generational cats. thing of jordan or lebron amen brother that's and which is something else you know that we we lost lebron you know here uh, so the final question i got is lightning round okay the final one uh favorite movie or short list ever Ooh, okay I Kara you go first yeah. okay well let's see in no particular order um I, I think probably one of my absolute favorites Schindler's List oh okay. there, I've never there, even there seen is, that have you not no oh, I haven't oh. I've never even watched it mm -hmm. oh my I, need, God. I need to oh, all, I, need I actually to. watched oh. it for the first time back this past fall yeah I, I need to I want to I yeah. hear it's phenomenal it, it, it is it, it is yeah. absolutely it's incredibly made yeah yes yes um hmm let me think for for me, a lot of it is you know what movies would I watch more than once? Yeah, because I'm I'm kind of a once and done. I really don't care to watch a lot of movies more than once. Um, <clears throat> honey, are you listening? <laughs> you know he is. Um, Shout out to David Hayes. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I really enjoy Gladiator. 
That's it's a good one. It's just fun to watch. Like it's you know. But it goes oh, forever. God. Oh, it does. Well, yeah, yeah no, it's, it, it's a it long does. movie. It, it, it really a long does. Movie. Um, God, it's so hard to even think about all the movies I've seen. Uh, you know, I, I, I know it's very dated, but I still really enjoy watching it. The original Nightmare on Elm Street. Oh, I love that movie. I, I love I, that movie. I can watch it anytime. I, I really can. It yeah. just. I am so in the minority because I've always thought. Part, well, I've come to think Part Two is a better film. I disagree with that, but I love Part Three. But Part Two, it's a good movie. I did enjoy it. It but is it's, so different. It's like it's like it Friday is. the Thirteenth Part Five. Yeah, it's completely on its own, and especially in the second one. In yeah, the and franchise, Friday the Thirteenth you know? Part Five is my favorite of the Friday the Thirteenths for that reason. Yeah, because the same as Halloween Three or I love Halloween Nightmare 3. Two is that it is so damn. It is it's such an outlier when you look at yeah, the Yeah, it's off the rails, series. man. Yeah. It's, it's totally off the rails. Uh, but I, I, I can go to Nightmare on Elm Street in any... It's one of those comfort movies. Isn't that weird? It is. I yeah. mean... It's a comfort Ma- movie. <laughs> Freddy is my is my horror boyfriend. Um, <laughs> and, and, Spirit oh, animal. Oh, yeah. man. Like, everybody that knows me, he's my horror boyfriend. <laughs> I love him. You hearing this, David Hayes? Are you hearing this? He knows. <laughs> he knows. You know, speaking of long movies, me and David Hayes one time, just a quick story, and I'll give my top mm-hmm. three real quick, and then we'll probably have to hit the stop button. We're, yeah. we're, we're getting a little long here. But uh, speaking of going a little long, one day me and David Hayes, we just had, we were going to a party or something, go figure, you know, and we were just trying to kill some time, a little bit of time. So we go to the Water Tower uh, movie, which was the dollar movies in Gastonia at the time. Well, man, when you want to kill an hour, hour and a half, what are you going to go see? Hey, I know. Let's go to Braveheart. No! Oh. <laughs> my God. I'm like, dude, I thought we were going to miss the party. I mean, like, we were like, but it was great. It, it's yep. a really great movie. But me and, me and uh, Two Dogs, David Hayes, uh, ended up watching that movie. And I just remember thinking it was going to end like four or five different times. I'm like, okay, man, let's go to the party. Oh, and it's still going on. Well, you know, in, the, in, in, in that like, uh, like, like dude code or man code or something, that's the one movie you're allowed to cry in? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, because at the end of it, freedom. We're like, oh, my God man oh my god i don't even think we i think we went to the party but we were just not in a good mood you know for the rest oh, of the night i can't imagine why yeah i know really it's bro, all right. bro, bro it'll so be okay yeah yeah for real man it's all right bro you know um we'll make it through this thing but we were literally like jesus man is this movie ever gonna fucking end you know <laughs> but it was just funny oh, let's go kill a little time yeah let's go hit the dollar dollar movie you know hey braveheart yeah okay and five and a half hours later oh my god man um but now my top movies man i know it's a little cliche uh, Empire Strikes Back. It's I'm a Star Wars nerd, man. I grew up on Star Wars. One of my first memories as a kid was watching Star Wars on TV and just being, oh my god! And uh, Empire Strikes Back is one of those movies I can just put on whenever I can put it on right now and and let it ride and watch every second of it. Um, Fair and Loathing Las Vegas. Um, that movie is so close to the real life. <laughs> I mean. I remember the first time I watched it, I was tripping on heavy acid while watching that movie for the first time, just thinking like, oh my God, this is greatest documentary ever. You know, um, yeah, I'll put it out there. I, I hated like, yeah. that movie. I love it. Oh my God. Do you and like I just, Terry Gilliam? Who? Terry Gilliam, the Who? director. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, there you go. There you yeah. go. Well, he also did Brazil and like a handful of those other movies like that. Like, I think he did Monty Python and all that too. Like, I mean, he's very like much a, 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 a certain taste, I guess. Well, that could, movie is not my taste. I then. love yeah. that movie. I can almost quote that movie. I think it's the most quotable movie I've ever seen. Like me and, and friends of mine, I always try to find a person who's seen that movie uh-huh. where where we can quote it. And I've about, except where I'm at now, you know, I work with some pretty you know straight laced people, cool people, great people. But like in my last job, the 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 stoner, the other guy, he was like, "Hey man, uh, you ever watch that movie Fear and Loathing?" And dude, we just started quoting, and we quoted, "Oh man." This kind of shit takes two grit, man. You know, I mean, that was just us, and that to this day. And my favorite movie of all time is Dazed and Confused. I love that movie, man. I could man, watch it any time, any place. Dazed and Confused is an outstanding movie. I was, I, I watched it this past week, actually. Oh, really? Night. Yeah, and I was having a, a, a message conversation online about it with a friend, where I said, "This is the perfect uh, teen movie because it's." not a high school movie but it's a movie about high school yes you're right and it's one that it doesn't make sense to watch as a teenager because you have to watch it as adult because it's right. not so yep. much about high school as it is it's how you remember high, high school. school and what was so great about that movie it came out the year i graduated yeah so i watched it and it was back in that day it was more about the 70s element yeah that was mm-hmm. the selling point of that movie oh man it's back in the cool era of the 70s and now it's been longer 
from the seventies to when that movie came out, from when it came out to now. But if you grew up you in know? a sm- if you grew up in a small town, and especially if you grew up in a small town in, in the, the south, south, yeah, when you watch Dazed and Confused, the you go, you just yep. watch it and you go, I knew that ca- I knew yep. every one of these characters. Yes, yes. I-, I hung out with Slater. I mean, I knew Slater. Hell, yeah. I watched Slater yeah. for a while. I mean, you know, uh, how you doing, Slater? I'd be a lot better in a minute, man. You know, yeah. popping a pill. I mean, you know, obviously I was never into the pill stuff, but the weed aspect. Like I said, that movie in the in the nineties was about the seventies aspect of the pot, the the band, greatest sound. I don't give a shit, man. That is the greatest soundtrack of all time. Is but that movie. but yeah, that's the thing I say about the movie is it's. It, it really doesn't make sense in the fullest sense when you watch it as a teenager. Right. You need to watch it as an adult. As an adult. And I'll go even further, Reverend, and say you should watch that movie at least every five years, at least, because... It's I can the, agree with that. The older you get, the more you see it from the different view in other words man you actually start seeing it from like the parents viewpoint at yeah. some point in that you know you go from the kid to the parents in the movie like the mean parent you know the mean dad you know who doesn't leave when his son's going to have the kegger party you, well, you kind of start seeing it from his aspect it's like hell no i ain't letting these kids tear up my fucking house well, you, you, know? <laughs> you, get, you get to the point like when you're watching as a teenager you think that wooderson or matthew mcconaughey is like the uh the, the coolest character, character the ever movie. he's the saddest when you watch it when you're he's 30, the saddest to- you go this guy is a fucking loser, loser. and i know him and yeah I, 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 dude yes that, exactly man but when you first watch that movie as a kid or as a younger person dude i want to be him yeah and then you're like thank god i'm not him mm-hmm. yeah definitely guys this has been a phenomenal time so let me give you give me my, okay. my short list yes yes sir yeah okay i'm gonna say uh blue velvet by david lynch okay i'm gonna say uh two movies from the 70s badlands and days of heaven both by terrence malick I'm going to say McCabe and Mrs. Miller by Robert Altman. Uh, the Last Temptation of Christ by Scorsese. Nice. Um, I'm also going to say Videodrome by Cronenberg. Uh, Do the Right Thing by Spike Lee. And uh, these are a little harder to recommend. I'm a huge fan of uh, uh, German cinema oh, from wow. the 70s. Yeah. So wow. any, anything, <laughs> if, if anybody's like a real film nerd listening to this, anything by uh, Werner Herzog or uh rainer verner fassbender anything by them um st- uh, and, get on and, that care and it, oh, get it, right on that it, it almost pains me to be able to leave like to have to leave like a lot of directors off the list like stanley kubrick or oh yeah anybody but um but yeah that would be my list yeah but i can say i've seen two of those video drone most and, people uh, have do I the watch, right thing yeah <laughs> i watch a lot of like uh already shit but at the same time uh it always bothers me where because knowing that i'll get all these movie recommendations from people who say uh hey check this out and i go okay and they go you like all that weird shit yeah yeah usually <laughs> and i'm usually like i'm gonna hate this movie yeah really yeah because it kind of goes full circle with yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anyway well carrie is there anything you'd like to end us with i'm so glad to be back yes this was great this has been glorious and we'll definitely not wait six months to do this one again because like i said the next episode we got lined up was what we were going to try to touch on today once again guys i didn't want to i didn't want to cut that short because that's a hell of a subject we'll definitely de- dive very deep into that next time um right, and we're go- we'll kind of leave a little bit of a cliffhanger there for everybody out there listen you got to stay tuned for that one reverend anything you want to end this with brother welcome to the terror dome <laughs> i love it <laughs> Until next time, you guys, take care. Once again, this was a blast, and we'll do it again soon. This is a test of the emergency broadcast system. The broadcasters of your area, in voluntary cooperation with the FCC and other authorities, have developed this system to keep you informed in the event of an emergency. If this had been an actual emergency, you would have been instructed where to tune in your area for news and official information. This concludes this test of the emergency broadcast system.